Okay, so this is the second part of the lecture for week two, symbolic interaction paradigms. So the way that they view society is that it's composed of symbols that people use to establish meaning, develop their views of the world, and communicate with each other. Symbols are just anything that stands for something else, either through relationship, association, convention. They can be material objects, language, vocals, gestures, images, sounds, pretty much anything that's not spoken word can be a symbol. Um, these vary by culture. Symbols are important for every culture and the same symbol can be used in different ways and have different meanings across cultures. For example, the swastika uh, was originally a holy symbol um, in Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist religions, and the Nazi party designed a similar one to represent this uh, Aryan race. So again, same symbol, very different depending on who you are and what culture you're in and how you're looking at it. So for symbolic interactionists, the meanings that we give to situations and their representation determines the nature of the interaction that we're going to engage in. So this, the situation is just the context for the interaction. The, the environment of the interaction. So as we change the definition of the situation, new symbols are used to give clues as to what's expected. So for example, in this top picture, yes, it's a seating area. It looks like somebody's living room. It looks very nice. That's somewhere you would sit, you could chat, um, be comfortable. This bottom picture on the left appears to either be a small church or more than likely a funeral parlor. Um, so again, same kind of environment, but there's slight cues that tell you that the expectations for your behavior are going to be different. So how do we define what the, si the situation is and how does that work so how, how do you define the situation of a college classroom classroom what are the representations of that you know you have a, apparently some guy standing up and pointing at I imagine a projector he seems to be in some sort of teacher role there's a bunch of desks or, you know, tiered lecture seating. So this is kind of the situation or the environment that the interaction is going to happen in. So what's the nature of the arrangement, the physical and social space and symbols that define this? You know, what, what does a classroom look like? And then what are the positions and the roles that define those interactions. You have the, the teachers, you have the students. Those are the two roles or positions and then what are the expectations of those? Is there a language that's used specifically? And then who defines the situation of this social interaction? So every time we enter into an interaction with others, we look for cues to determine how the situation is defined and how we're going to behave. The situation also defines what position we're supposed to occupy in that interaction and what the expected behavior is within that role that we're in. So again, a place with a lot of seating, 
it's kind of a very loose generalization of the situation. But again, from the picture on the top, it's very formal. The way that you would be expected to behave in that situation is going to be extremely different than the one on the bottom left, which is a Catholic church, versus the one on the bottom right, which is a ball game. So definition of the self as a definition of the situation. Not only do we define the situations that we act in, but we also define ourselves as part of that situation. So is there one self or do we have different selves in different situations? Is the person that we portray ourselves as being the same across all situations? Or are you projecting a different definition of yourself to your friends and family than you do to say myself, if you were going to see me at um, campus or the dean or a police officer? So the, the way we portray ourselves changes across situations because we are, we are modifying our behavior to reflect the expected role. So the self develops as a result of interactions with others. We define ourselves to others, communicating who we are to others in different social contexts and situations. The idea of the looking glass self, um, how we become defined is partially in terms of how we are defined by others. So the way that other people view us and then treat us as a result of that makes a very large contribution to how we view ourselves. However, not all that we project will be accepted and reflected back in the same way that we, that we want to project it. So um, in the sense, our definition of self is often negotiated between what we want and what others see. So which others are, are these that we're talking about? It's not just anybody. It's not just some random dude that you run into at the library or the guy behind the counter at McDonald's. These aren't the people that, that help define us. The others that we're referring to are our significant others, people that play an important role within our lives, generally close friends, family, So power and situations. Um, one area of symbolic interactionists have not really emphasized is the role of power in how we define situations. Not everyone has the same power to define a situation or the context of the interaction. So how is power exercised to define the situation or the social context? Is the definition of the situation negotiated or is it dictated by those people in power? Does the position of the actors define the power they have in the situation? You know, what about those in less powerful positions? Do they still have some power as far as defining it? Um, all things to, to consider. So as far as social problems, um, causes and solutions, social problems are usually constructed. Um, they are definitions of situations. Uh, the cause is the ability of those with sufficient power to define the condition as problematic and to define some conditions as the cause. So what we consider to be a problem is based on what the people in power say is a problem. Because if nobody says it's a problem, it's not a problem. 
that's kind of the way of thinking in this. So solutions are similarly socially constructed, usually out of some negotiating um, between peoples in defining the solution. Sorry, solutions are socially constructed. Uh, it's early, I apologize. I'm still having my coffee. Um, so how does violence play into this? The, for symbolic interactionists, fo the focus is on the individual and the groups that are interacting and in determining the meaning of what violence is. So does the definition of violence differ from group to group and society to society? You know, when we talked earlier about cultures and how the definition of violence changes, depending on at least the legal view, then then that's definitely the case. You know, when you have, uh, you know, a group of, of small kids or even middle school kids that are hanging out and, you know, they're roughhousing and, you know, the boys are playing, you know, one of those silly games where you give each other rug burns or whatever, you know, is that considered violence within that context? Probably not. It's, you know, they're young boys. It's a game. If you take that same interaction and put it in adults, you know, between adults with each other, where they're, you know, roughhousing, you're probably going to think it's a fight. It's going to look more like a fight. So it does change based on who the group is. You know, are they friends? Are they strangers? You know, what are their interactions together? How are they related to each other? So the definition of meaning and violence is central to understanding violence. So what meaning and definition do those involved use to understand violence? You know, like I was saying, you know, the, the context and the, um, the actors play a role in defining those things. Um, I apologize for this typo. I don't know. I had some assistance with these and I don't know why it says hockey sport, but, um, <laughs> I apologize for somebody not understanding that. Okay, so the definition is relative to the groups that you're acting within. Um, the, the focus is on all forms of violence that is recognized by the actors. If you don't recognize it as violence, you're not going to define it as violence. You know, if you don't think it's a big deal, you're not going to say it's a big deal. So what is the cause and role of violence as far as they're concerned? So the cause is reduced to the motives and the understanding of the people involved in committing the acts and being victimized. So violence is connected to the self. How do we define ourselves in that violent situation? What is our position and role in the context? Are we being the perpetrator? Are we being the victim? Um, you know, if this is a road raid situation, there was just, um, I work in Whitley County and there was just a situation where some guy pulled over after being cut off and the dude stopped and beat him to the point that he died the next day for, cause it was an elderly man. Um, that is a situation where, yeah, I'm sure that the, the guy that got beat up and passed, he obviously probably felt like a victim, but in that same context, the guy that was beating on him felt slighted causing him to have that rage. And I'm sure in the moment he felt justified in acting on that within that violence. So that's something to consider, you know, how yourself and your role is connected to the act. Um, 
they also see violence as something that's learned. You don't wake up, you know, you're not born being a violent, a violent being. You, you learn how to do it. You learn how to shoot. You learn how to punch people. You learn how to drop atomic bombs. Um, learning the definition of situations and where violence is appropriate. These are all things that we learn. Um, violence has symbolic meaning to the actors that share that definition of the situation. Um, so violence is determined by the situation. Uh, symbols that communicate violence are important in defining the situation. Um, incidents such as hate speech, violence is learned in the context of social groups that define what it means. So all of these people are making gestures, but depending on the context, these gestures can mean different things. You know, it, it's coming from a late night talk show host. It's, it will mean one thing. If it's coming from the police, it's going to mean something very different. And this, you know, nice, happy little stoner guy here on the bottom. You know, these hand symbols mean different things based on the context of the groups that they're involved in. So then just something now that we've covered all the paradigms, you know, conflict, order, functionalism, and now symbolic interaction, just something to think about how each of these paradigms would view these acts of violence. You know, what, how, what would they say about gang violence? What would they say about rape, police violence, terrorism, uh, spousal abuse, punishment in schools? All three of these paradigms are going to look at these acts of violence differently as far as what the causes are, therefore what the possible solutions are. So something to consider. Okay, um, that's all I have for today for this section. Um, again, for those of you who have not already done so, please send me an email with your case study topic. Um, I've gotten several weird threads where different students have responded to announcements. Please don't do that. Um, it's very hard to weed through all of it and find what you're wanting to communicate with me. So if you could please send a separate email, you could just put case study or topic or something in the subject line. Um, that way it goes directly to me. My email is on Blackboard in multiple areas as well as um, on the syllabus. So please send me that as soon as you can. That way you get preference to what you're wanting. Um, I also feel like the majority of you have already completed the syllabus quiz, so thank you for that. Um, you do have two attempts to do all of the learning module quizzes. Um, you do only have one opportunity to do the reaction papers though. So for the, for the learning modules that ask you to watch a film and write a response, there will be only one submission for that, um, barring any kind of technical difficulties. Um, so just be aware that when you take the quizzes, you do have two opportunities to do it and there's no time limit. So if you do feel like, you know, I'm not really sure about this one, I want to look at it really quick, or you take it and you're like, you know, I feel like I could do better, you're welcome to take it again. It's only going to record the highest attempt. Um, so that that gives you a little bit of opportunity to, to fudge your grade a bit. Um, I don't offer um, extra credit per se, but I do offer that second attempt at the quiz to to help boost your points um, if needed. So, and they're available all semester. So if you decide you don't want to do your second attempt now, but then towards the end of the semester, you're like, you know, I really need like 10 more points. Um, you can always go back and 
and try them again to try to get those extra points. So, all right. Thanks guys.